previously on the Top 100. When he's gone, the league's going to miss him, not just his teams. The league is going to miss him. Bronco ran the football like he was boiling over with rage. He ran guys down the explosion of a cobra. For me, Barry is the best running back of all time. 45, and bumps to the 40, breaks it, 35, 30, he's gone! Unbelievable! I mean, you go and look at Otto's record, and all he ever did was win championships. Sacking the cornerback is just like, like you devastate a city. Like you put all the offensive players in one bag, and I just take a baseball bat and beat on the bag. Sammy Ball would be a combination of today's version of Tom Brady, Brian Mormon, and Ed Reed. At the end of the day, you want to rock people. You've got to make them afraid of you. And they, uh, they didn't want any piece of him, man. He devastated defensive ends in this league. I mean, he put them on the ground. He put them off the line of scrimmage. He protected the court, everything. He was a destroyer. He wanted to run through people. He wanted to hurt you. And now, the 10 greatest players in pro football history. I'm old, so I've been around seeing a lot of great players uh, over a long period of time. And I think a player that was great in his time is going to be great in all circumstances. Those people that are great players, they take over the game and they take over the sport for the period of time that they're in it. They take it over, and everyone knows who that player is. Uh, you can go watch the Chicago Bears play, and you'll remember that Dick Butkus was there. made big things happen when he hit people. I mean, that's the one thing that he could do to change the game. It was just awesome. So you had to get him blocked because he's going to make a play from sideline to sideline. I played for the 49ers, and I was there one year ahead of Dick. I came in 1964. Dick came in 65. Interestingly enough, he really didn't take on the blocker. Dick would actually do everything that he could to avoid you. He may olay you like a bullfighter and then keep right on going. Dick didn't even care about you. He just wanted that ball carrier. I want to just let them know that they've been hit. And when they get up, they don't have to look to see who was, uh, that hit them shouldn't be any puzzle. When they come to, they got to say, well, it must have been Butkus that got me. By the time Dick had played, maybe a year or two, he was pretty outspoken. He'd be talking during the game. He kind of played with a chip on his shoulder. I mean, if you were going to push him around, he was going to turn around and he was ready to be combative. I never examined his inner thoughts and didn't talk to him about those things, but if he could intimidate somebody, he was going to do that, because he could. Dick Butkus was much more than an intimidator. In just nine seasons, he forced 47 turnovers, including a then-NFL record 25 fumble recoveries. His career was cut short by a broken-down knee but not before Butkus had played every down of football he possibly could. 
He stood for something just as important as victory. He gave everything he had on every play. In 69, I was traded to the Bears, and we won one game. We beat the Pittsburgh Steelers. We won one game, and he was named Defensive Player of the Year. It's really quite a remarkable accomplishment when you think about what a lousy team it was. Jim Dooley had just taken over for George Hallis, and he was the team leader and all that. So Jim Dooley had a team meeting, and Butkus said, hey, Jim, let me talk. And so Jim Dooley uh, let him talk. It's Dick. So Dick says, you know, we wouldn't have any problems here if you guys would get your, your head out of your ass and, and play like you're supposed to play. And that was the end of the meeting. I mean, he could have walked out of the locker room and not said a word and still been great. And Dick didn't do that. Don't lose it. He was so passionate about his team. Let's go. Come on now. That was Dick. I just think that when you compare him to the guys in the first 25 years of NFL history, which is all you can do, he's head and shoulders above in speed in production, in toughness, in versatility. I think Don Hudson is the most dominant single player at his position of any in NFL history. Here's Don Hudson, once the pride of Alabama, one of the fastest men in pro football. If you look at guys who dominated their sports over a long period of time, a guy like Wilt Chamberlain in basketball, maybe Wayne Gretzky in hockey. I think the only one who comes close to what Hudson did with the touchdown catch is Babe Ruth with home runs. He was the most dominant player in his era, an 11-year era in the 30s and 40s. Don Hudson led the NFL in receiving in eight of his 11 seasons and averaged a touchdown catch every five receptions on his way to a career total of 99. Don's blazing speed made him hard to cover. This time, watch him take a long throw from Herbert, good for six points. In Hudson's last year, he actually scored 29 points against the Lions in 13 minutes, even after their coach, Gus DeRay, ordered a second man to cover Hudson. One of the things that DeRay said after the game was, this game can be summed up in three words. Too much Hudson. When he retired, he had three times as many touchdown receptions as any receiver in the first 25 years of pro football. It took 44 years, long into the era when people filled the air with footballs, for someone to catch more than 99 touchdown passes in his career. Steve Largent did it. Number 100! And that long pursuit of Don Hudson's career touchdown reception is over. In 1963, Hudson was chosen as a charter member of the Pro Football Hall of Fame. I think anybody that you see in the Hall of Fame loves to play football. To be in the first class is just about as high an honor as I think as any football player could have had. I truly believe that Don Hudson would have been a prolific receiver in 1997 as well as 1937. Don Hudson is the best receiver of all time and I'd call him the best player of all time. Hudson puts on more speed and reaches out for a 50-yard pass. Yow! 50 yards if it's an inch. And completed. Yes, sir. You can put in whatever piece you want to put with 18, 18 to make it work. All he says is just find your way open. I'll get the ball there. 
And that's what the Reggie Waynes, the Dallas Clarks, the Marvin Harrisons. Touchdown, Austin Kelly! Touchdown, Peter Garson! That's how dominant he is. And he throws the stone play. That's, yeah. that's If you take him out the game, no disrespect to nobody else on the coast, but you make them a very below average ball club. Peyton Manning is the only four-time MVP in NFL history. In 10 of his first 12 seasons, he led the Colts to 10 or more wins. But his greatest legacy may be his mental approach. Manning has turned the art of quarterbacking into a science. 54! 54! Round right! A lot of, you know, the first set of red, blue, hot, hot, is to see if you're jumping to your shell. If you jump into your shell, it's easy. 235! Reggie, you got L! You could disguise him a certain way, but now he studied all that. That's how he beats you in places where you say, I can't get beat there. Ray Lewis right at the goal line. He made it through strike for a touchdown. On the championship year, his championship year, he made one, I think, one of the probably greatest throws. Corey Ivey was covering Dallas Clark. A big third down. 3.57 left to play in the ball game. Manning will throw it. Steps up. Fires on the numbers. It is caught oh the 30 God. yard line. Before Dallas came out of his break, he had already released the ball. The clock moves on. First down, Colts. But release the ball to a point, Corey Hand was outstretched, and the ball, I, I still say to this day, and it grazed Corey's fingernails. I have no idea how Peyton Manning threaded that needle. You're pissed off in the game when it happens, <laughs> but what after it happens, you're like, that's why he's Peyton Manning. Anybody can say, oh, Peyton is good, and da 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 da. But he works to be. You're talking about a guy pregame two, three hours, whatever his number one receiver is. Those same throws he makes in the game, so those same throws in pregame. But how many people will do that? Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. From practice to pregame to the game. Colts win! They win! I try to tell my sons that. I'm like, that just didn't happen? He didn't just wake up and just, oh, I'm good. No, I guarantee you, there were some hours he spent by himself. A lot of them. That's what greatness is, man. Greatness is by yourself. Nobody else can make you be great. And that's why I appreciate it when I see it. I remember when Steve Young came to San Francisco, uh, he had played against Reggie White in the, in the old USFL. And, uh, you know, we'd be looking at film, getting ready to play the Eagles, and he goes, Mike, I gotta tell you about this guy. It didn't take me long to figure out if I'm game planning against that defense, I'll take my chances with everybody else. We had to double Reggie White every single snap. Otherwise, he could single-handedly take over the game. One man changed your offensive thinking for the entire game. In eight seasons with the Philadelphia Eagles, Reggie White played in 121 games and recorded 124 sacks. You know, when I'm on the field, I want to do my best to intimidate the guy in front of me. And I want to do my best to have him intimidated before I play him. That means that this week I got to play a good enough game to where he'll look at it next week and say, oh man, you know, look what he did to him. After the 1992 season, White was a free agent. Mike Holmgren was preparing for his second year as the head coach in Green Bay. When he had an epiphany about the player known as the Minister of Defense. If I don't want to have to stop him, I'll have to sign him. 
and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. You know, Reggie's very devout. He was a Baptist, an ordained Baptist minister. So on a whim, I just phoned him up. And I left a message on his answering machine, Reggie, this is God. I want you to play in Green Bay. And then I hung up the phone. Fortunately, he has a great sense of humor, and he, heard, he recognized it was my voice, and, and uh, he came to my office, he goes, in his voice, he goes, hey, Mike, that was pretty funny, that was good, so. Uh, we wound up signing him, and it, at the time, it was a huge signing bonus. And people thought, oh boy, they've really gone and done it, you know, it's too high. But you know what, he was worth every penny and more. His first year with me against Denver, I remember a Monday night game, we needed a sack desperately, and he sacked John Elway. Two sacks in a row right near the end of the game to allow us to win the game. He was special, and he made Sean Jones special. He made Santana Dotson special, Gilbert Brown special. All those big guys that played up front, someone was gonna be singled up because you had Reggie White on your side. We had Favre on the offense, leading the offense, but Reggie was the guy that kind of put it all together for us and, and allowed us to get to the Super Bowl. Seizing the stage just as he had against John Elway on Monday night, Reggie White recorded two of his Super Bowl record three sacks on consecutive plays in the second half to help secure a Packer win. After the game, you win the game, and everyone, you're in a kind of a fog, really. But he grabbed that trophy and ran around. He knew exactly how he wanted to celebrate. It was a beautiful thing to see. You know, Reggie, he was a special player. One of the greatest players of all time. He came out of the blue. Nobody knew him, didn't look like a football player, didn't act like a star. And then to come out of nowhere to the right place, which was a town that he was just perfect for, Baltimore. Nobody even knew his name when he first got there. Unitas was how he was first introduced. Eventually, everyone would know the name of this obscure former semi-pro quarterback. Johnny Unitas' career became the sport's most famous Cinderella saga. This was somebody who came from a working class background, comes to a working class city, and refuses to put on airs. We liked him because he was tougher than any quarterback. The hits that Unitas took somehow added to the whole aura. Baltimore was bereft of any kind of glamour. And so when we began to win, it meant more to Baltimore than it would have meant to, to any other city. And I really mean that, to any other, other city. We had nothing else. Unitas belonged to us absolutely, completely. Unitas's career-defining performance in the 1958 NFL Championship game helped change the course of NFL history. The position was born that day. The, the great two-minute drill at the end. Nobody had ever talked of that sort of thing before. The idea that you were going to move down the field, bing, 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 like that. That was really a new concept. Unitas threw for 349 yards and directed a game-tying drive with time running out. Then, in an unprecedented sudden-death overtime period, he threw the Giants off balance with his bold, unpredictable play calling and led the Colts to an historic victory. Unitas is releasing the Congratulations, I've never seen, I have never seen a greater job in any football game, pro or college in my life. John, it was just stupendous. Thank you very much, Chuck. My job is made easier by the boys up in front, believe me. That 
vision of him, I think, was embedded in the American mind thereafter. And, and, and every quarterback since then, whoever it is, one of the Mannings, Brady, whoever, can be placed in that template. It, it all descends from Johnny Unitas on that December day in 1958. From 1957 through 1960, Johnny Yu set a record by throwing at least one touchdown pass in 47 consecutive games. That record still stands, and no one has ever come close to breaking it. It's more likely that DiMaggio's 56-game hitting streak record would be broken than United's 47 touchdown passes in a row. That it's that extraordinary. You know, I never knew that I was throwing touchdown passes in every ball game and had setting some kind of a record. I don't look at the record books. <laughs> Did we win? That's all I care about. It's not important whether Unitas was the greatest. He is the quarterback for all time in the same sort of category as Babe Ruth. Babe Ruth is the baseball player for all time, no matter what kind of records are set no matter what happens to the game. Unitas is the one and only now. And as such, I think he'll only be more legendary as time passes. Before the countdown continues, here's a look back at players 10 to six. Number 10, Dick Butkus. Number nine, Don Hudson. Number eight, Peyton Manning. Number seven, Reggie White. Number six, Johnny Unitas. And now, number five. I don't know the game, but I can tell you in a moment was the first time I saw him on television. And I didn't know who he was. And I saw him make this one run. He fought for every inch. He must have twisted and knocked three or four guys over, spun around, accelerated. And I said, oh my goodness. <laughs> What kind of animal is this? What kind of guy is this? All those moves and the strength and the tenacity. That was it. I didn't have to see any more. I knew this was a great runner. I was a runner that wouldn't die easy. It's like one of those cowboy movies where a guy is coming at him and, and he gets shot once, he goes down. He gets shot again and he gets again and again and he's still walking. Then all of a sudden, big explosion, go boom, arm over here, arm over there, leg over there, and they still trying to get together. That's the type of runner I was. Walter Payton was more than just a great runner. He was the most complete football player in the history of the game. Rolling out left, being no. chased by Browner, stops and eats the left side of the end zone for Payton over the no. shoulder. Peyton left his unique mark on all who watched him soar up the all-time rushing list. Perhaps his acrobatic touchdown jumps leaped to mind. To some, it was his feared straight arm that they remember most. For others, it was his 275-yard performance against the Vikings, despite the flu and 102-degree fever. But for the authority on great runners, it was Peyton's sheer will that truly defined him. We were warriors, and he was a great warrior. If a guy runs out of bounds because a cornerback is coming up to hit him, that's not my kind of guy. Walter was definitely one of them, because he was a powerful man. Give me the heart of Walter Payton. There's never been a greater heart. 
Sweetness knew toughness and what it took to reach the mountaintop. Finally, after 13 seasons, he stood at the brink of the all-time rushing summit. Waiting for him was the great Jim Brown. Well, there's some individuals that if they broke a record and they did it the wrong way, they wouldn't hear from me. <laughs> but the way that he was, his attitude, his ability, I have all the admiration in the world for him. High formation, quick pitch to Walter, looking for the record. Peyton was my friend, uh, the epitome of greatness, admired and respected by all. The outcome of a Super Bowl berth hangs in the balance. Montana rolling out the right. By the mid-80s, Joe Montana was a two-time Super Bowl champion and a two-time Super Bowl MVP. Caught by Clark, it's a touchdown for the 49ers! An intimidating presence to a rookie receiver in 1985. I remember walking into that locker room and I looked across and it was like uh, deer in the headlights. I'm looking at the man. You know, I'm looking at God, <laughs> Joe Montana, and I was so nervous, but uh, he really made me feel comfortable, and I knew that we would have a great relationship together. Montana was football's ultimate winner. Though during his era, there were quarterbacks with stronger arms, a quicker release, and more chiseled physiques. Those little skinny legs that he had, Legs that look like, what, what type of bird? Uh, a stork? Well, he's got funny legs for a quarterback, oh. doesn't he? <laughs> the last time I saw legs like that, they were hanging out of a nest. <laughs> 34 years to get this development. <laughs> they were so skinny. He didn't have a calf. I'm like, how can this guy move around like that? But, you know, the thing about him, he was elusive. You couldn't catch him. He could feel pressure, and he would get rid of that football. If he didn't have the primary, it was the second or the third receiver. Just complete control of the offense, precision, it's a clinic. I wanted to play the game as more of a chess game, and one move's gonna lead to another, and you're not always going to get the king immediately. Four yard here, five yard there, 10 yard here is as wearing, if not more, on a defense than 170 yard touchdown. That was more my style than anything. He knew exactly where everybody was going to be on that football field. And I think that's really what made him the best quarterback. And plus, he was Joe Cool. You knew that when everything was on the line, if you had a minute left in the ball game, Joe wouldn't let us down. So there's two seconds left, and Montana will get one throw. Here is Montana throwing for the end zone. Right face, he's got it! Super Bowl 23 on the final drive. With 3.10 remaining, the 49ers will have to go from their eight-yard line. We were at ease. We had the best quarterback, and that was Joe Montana. Montana back to throw on first down. Throws over the middle, completes it to Craig. Craig is to the 16. Montana trying to drive him the length of the field here with the game in the balance. 16 to 13, the Bengals lead. To watch Joe Montana do this, this absolute surgeon on the football field and one of the all-time greats, it's almost like poetry. 39 seconds remaining. Back to throw Montana. Stepped up, throws. Montana played in four Super Bowls and won them all. In those four victories, he threw 11 touchdowns and no interceptions. He is the only three-time Super Bowl MVP. There may have been passers more imposing physically and more impressive statistically, 
but no big game quarterback was more awe-inspiring. I think the greatest quarterback that ever put on football cleats is two words, Joe Montana. <laughs> You know, I had this one kid, Lawrence Taylor. Now, every linebacker in the league thinks they're worth $900,000. Your guy, guys. Fred Young, yeah. Chip Banks, Pickett, yeah. yeah. just name them. Yeah. There's a list of them. And there's only one guy like the all That's time. right. I got a guy that's a 350 hitter for eight years. One, guys hit it 350 one time, they want the... You know what I mean? It's awful. Yeah. There was only one Lawrence Taylor, and he was worth every penny. His freakish athleticism and sheer relentlessness made him a new kind of linebacker, one the league had never seen and could rarely stop. The traditional ways of pass protecting, assigning a back to the outside linebacker, proved to be not applicable when he got into football because he was a mismatch on most backs, uh, if not all. There's Lawrence Taylor with one man trying to block him. It can't happen. One man cannot block Lawrence Taylor. In the running game, they had to come up with some schemes where they could keep him from just running behind the line of scrimmage and chasing the plays down. The challenge was to let the talent flourish without breaking down the structure of the defense. We're playing against the Cardinals. He was supposed to be dropping in coverage and he rushed and sacked the quarterback. I said, look, you got this wrong. You're off in coverage and not rushing. Oh, yeah, 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 you tell me. So later in the game, the same situation comes up. And do you know the son of a gun does the same thing? But this time, he sacks Neil Lomax. And George Martin picks it up and we score with it. Okay, so now we got two sacks and a touchdown out of it. Everybody's mobbed them in the end zone and they're jumping on top of each other. They come up the sideline and I'm just staring at him cold. And he goes, I did it again, didn't I? <laughs> and I said, yeah, you did it again. And he, I said, we don't even have what you're doing. He said, well, we better put it in Monday, he says, because it's a dandy. <laughs> Taylor's instinctive approach to the game produced 132 and a half sacks, but it was his fiery will to compete that made him the only linebacker ever named NFL MVP. Hey, Sully, man, hope I never get back in there. I will kick your ass. Hey, baby, let's go out there like a bunch of crazy dogs. Have some fun. Son, I got to bed in this. Never did that flame burn brighter than on a Sunday night in New Orleans, when LT proved he could take control of a game with only one arm. He gets strapped up like this, you really have to want to go back down. This is like a gladiator. If we had Julius Caesar sitting up there, he'd probably be applauding this man's effort. He still managed to play and be a force in the game. Tonight, Lawrence Taylor has got that throttle open at about 200%. I think it's a signature game. After the game, we were in the locker room. I remember grabbing the back of his head and putting it kind of on my forehead because it was very noisy. And I said, that was, that was the best. That's the best I've seen you do. And uh, he told me, he said, I don't know how I ever got through that one, Bill. He is certainly a mug the very greatest players to ever play this game. Before the countdown continues, here's a look back at players 10 to 3. Number 10, Dick Butkus. Number 9, Don Hudson. Number 8, Peyton Manning. 
Number seven, Reggie White. Number six, Johnny Unitas. Number five, Walter Payton. Number four, Joe Montana. Number three, Lawrence Taylor. And now, number two. This is a, a picture of Jim Brown, and I treasure that very much, but I treasure the words even more. Bert, a friend over 25 years, you have remained a man, and a man of his word, and that's rare. Your friend, wherever you are, Jim. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings in a single bound. The pro game in the pop age had a number of superstars. But only one superman, and he was Jim Brown. Jim thought on Sundays, uh, and these are his words, that he was a god. That nobody could hurt him. Nobody could touch him. Nobody was better. And uh, he proved it every Sunday. He always shocked everybody, I think, how fast he was. And then you tack onto that 225 pounds and mean, tough runner. In nine record-setting seasons, Jim Brown led the league in rushing eight times. Brown was a three-time MVP. He is the only runner ever to average over 100 yards per game and over five yards per carry for a career. That so-called macho, which I, I hate that word, but he, he embodies it. I played nine seasons, I never missed a game and I never laid out on the football field. I might not have the greatest ability of everybody, but the one thing that stands is that when it was time to play, I was there. was the NFL's all-time leading rusher and touchdown king when he retired. With an NFL championship and nothing more to accomplish, Brown walked away when he was just 29. When I quit, uh, I was happy. I had nine good years. I did all the things I wanted to do. I went into movies. I started talking to pretty girls. Oh, I've never looked back. Brown and Reynolds first met when they were co-stars in the 1969 Western 100 Rifles. There was a scene where we had to fight each other. So I fought him on a cliff about 75 feet down to the first rock. And then the, he got me dangling there. And he said, you know, I'm really getting kind of sick of this height. I said, really? Well, screw you. If we fall, it's going to say Jim Brown, an unknown actor, die. For me, a lot of people want to talk about other actors. Nobody wants to talk to Jim Brown about other football players. They want to talk about Jim Brown. I think even people that never even saw him play, you say Jim Brown and they sort of uh, whisper. Did you see him? Did you know him? He was everything I hoped he would be, and a hell of a lot more. I was a big fan, to be honest with you. I was a coaching intern. I just followed him around and watched him. He had a magic about him. He's Flash 80 because that's what he had on his license plate. But when I started coaching him in Oakland, we nicknamed him the GOAT the greatest of all time. So we've got a lot of great nicknames for Jerry Rice. I pronounce it Jerry Rice. Five capital R's, I-C-E. This dude is, this is a bad dude right here. 
is the most dominant player at his position that I've ever seen. This guy had a 154 mile an hour fastball. You could not cover him. He wants the end zone. Rice has got it. Touchdown oh, 49ers. He could beat double coverage. You could put man to man with help over the top. However you want to try to defend him, he can beat any coverage. He can take a short pass to the house. Probably the greatest receiver after the catch. He's got Rice. He breaks loose. He's going to be gone. I don't think they can catch him. A play that seems to work every time they do it. I would prefer to catch a five-yard slant and go 95 yards any day. <laughs> it's almost like the hair is like standing up on your back because you know everybody is chasing you. If you're able to cross that goal line without getting caught, no, it's a great feeling. We used to have a, a board where we measured yards after the catch. We used to put up Irving Fryer, Michael Irvin, Jerry Rice. I don't know how many yards this guy made throughout his career after the catch, but it was a lot because I charted it for three years. And he did it for two decades. And if you look at his statistics, where he is, and where the number two and three and four guy are, it's amazing what he accomplished. Oh my! A one-handed catch down the sidelines, one of his greatest catches. He's, he's a work of art. Jerry Rice is king of the mountain. 22,895 receiving yards, 1,549 receptions, 208 touchdowns, the most in history. No one else comes close. Rice dominated the record books, yet his true mastery was of preparation, mind, body, and soul. We sent some guys with him to work out a couple times. They'd come back, and that man is crazy. That guy's crazy. He's running up and down hills. You cannot imagine this guy's stamina. His best football was played in a two-minute drill late in games. Most of the time, guys get a little bit tired. Not this guy. With the game in the balance, 16 to 13, the Bengals lead. Montana back to throw. Throws over the middle. A five for Rice. Rice it. When the games got bigger and the situations got tighter, Jerry Rice played his best football. Rice's eight touchdown catches in the Super Bowl are the most all-time. He won three and was MVP in one. He's a champion, a Hall of Famer, and the number one player on the top 100. You know, what's funny is when I meet and talk to young receivers and I make cut-up reels to show a route, an in route, an out route, a post, a slant, they all love to see Jerry Rice. all know who the GOAT was. They all know who Jerry Rice was. The greatest of all time. <laughs>